before we get into this episode, I just want to wish everybody a really, really happy Diwali. I hope you're safe. I hope you're having fun. And I hope you're using this time to read more. Secondly, I've linked all of the books that we've talked about today and even Sharknik's personal works in the description below. So before you leave, make sure to check that out. And I hope you have fun in this episode. Hello everyone and welcome back to Shelf Life. This is Simran and this is my podcast Shelf Life. We talk about books, their philosophies, but most importantly, our personal relationship with a book. And today we have a really special guest. Again, it's Sharknik Chakravarti. Um, for those of you who don't know who Sharknik is, he is a student uh, at St. Xavier's College. He's a really good friend of mine. Um, he is a budding economist. Right, and very recently he was selected to represent India at the South Asian Economic Student Meet, and the project that you're going to be working um, on is probably going to be presented at World Bank, if I'm not wrong. So yeah. that's that's pretty cool, and I'm I'm really excited for you. I know that you're going to do a great job, and I think the reason why I have you here is because um, a lot of people might not know about this is um, that. You are a lover of the arts. Uh, you read a lot of books, and um, I think you read. You're probably one of the few people I know who reads probably just as much as me, or who's read more than me, uh, which is a huge thing. And yeah, I just want you to talk about something that's maybe not in your bio, what maybe not what we've discussed. Not uh, people might not know about you. So just talk to us about you. All right. Thank you. Thanks for that generous introduction. <laughs> um, what do you want me to talk about? Uh, Just talk about you. Tell tell us something about you. Yeah. So as you said, budding economist, I think would be the at this moment probably the best way to describe me. The thing is, identity is always a flux, right? I don't know. Um, mm-hmm. My friends constantly keep saying this that even though I mean I got into this World Bank thing, right? But I'm always complaining about how I don't want to do economics, so <laughs> it's it's kind of a sort of split thing. But I would say that, as you said, the biggest part of my heart, if not to be too dramatic, is definitely still literature. Mm-hmm. Whether it's novels, whether it whether it's movies, um, you know that I've been writing for a long time now, and I used to write a lot more fiction than I do now. I've kind of moved more towards nonfiction. Mm-hmm. Part, partly because economics, research papers, things like that, and partly because sort of trying to engage more with the world around me. Right. So over this vacation, yes, that's what I've been trying to do. I kind of got away from reading, so I I got I got myself back to some of the classics of Indian literature. Mm-hmm. And yeah, that's me. I yeah. Yeah. Tell me, what are you reading right now? I just started reading Discovery of India, and. Mm. That's been great, um, but I've only read like thirty or forty pages so far. Before that, I finished this book called "Everybody Loves a Good Drought" mm. by P. Sainath. Yeah, and we can. T- I, I I have so many emotions about it. I can talk about that for hours. But I think the emotion you have when you leave that book, I think, if anything, that solidified my kind of interest in development economics, if you will. Every if you read that book, you see the kind of injustices around. It's a book on rural poverty. Mm-hmm. and anything anything other than that like taking your eyes away from that and focusing on the sort of urban privilege that we live within all of it feels like a waste of time now like right. not focusing on that so i think if anything maybe in the years to come that book might end up becoming one of the most influential books mm-hmm. i read in college so yeah very moving book for sure yeah i loved what you said about how um everybody loves a good drought drought even though it's not a fiction book and uh, it's not exactly connected to our lives but it, it just it still had such a great impact on you and that's what we talk about here at chef life we discuss how books have an impact on our lives even if they're not directly related to us and and that's why i want to talk to you about like what has been your journey like with books i mean why did you start reading and where do you think you are in your relationship with books right now like how do you feel like it shaped you as a person oh very much so it's been a very staggered relationship i'll contrary to what you said i did start reading books out of kind of a personal need for satisfaction not to kind of know more about the world i remember mm-hmm. 
it's very clear the first ever time that i was entranced by a book it was this amar chitra katha novel right when i was in fifth yeah. standard it's a, it's a graphic novel it's not even a proper written book but mm-hmm. it was in the library it was in fifth grade and we had this library period i picked up that book and it's a 30 minute kind of interval and i started reading that and it might sound too dramatic now but you know it was the first time i ever got so much into it that the sounds around you people playing making noises all of that disappeared you know it was this oh yeah extreme level of concentration you had into this story that everything else vanished and i think that was mm-hmm. the starting point and my dad's always been a lot into literature so i told him about this yeah. experience i had and since then it kind of moved towards sort of a more formal introduction to literature with mm-hmm. uh, the little prince i remember was one of the more influential yeah. books by uh, atma de saint exupery and that was more on the creative side of things uh, about how to kind of view a world creatively Uh-huh. since then it's changed a lot um when i went to new zealand and because i didn't have you have a like i had a lot of like a cultural alienation to that place correct so i think at that time i kind of veered more towards reading philosophy just trying to philosophy and history trying to understand more about the place that i'm in and my relationship with the world and more generally speaking you have the whole existential angst when you're like 15 <laughs> yeah. 16 17 and moving to that that entire two or three year phase which was mostly sort of existential literature moving that to now which is a lot more non fiction for sure and now it's more informative it's trying to use my time to get to know as much of the world as possible mm-hmm. yeah it's so wonderful that i think it just happens so organically that the books we read kind of mirror um, where it's we so are enough. okay <laughs> it the books we read really mirror where we are in our lives and i've always wondered you know does that happen does like what comes first Do, does it does it change in our lives in our professional life or whatever it is does that happen first or does your shift in reading happen first and i don't think i've ever like gotten around to you know an answer for that i mean what do you think like what comes first I really think it's a chicken and egg dilemma because mm-hmm. especially if you're someone who is into the world of literature and your life really does depend on books directly I think books come first because correct you're going to I I remember this because every time I've read a book maybe accidentally mm-hmm. that something I picked up and that ended up changing my view on things and my subsequent kind of approach towards writing so mm-hmm. when it's when it's sort of fiction or non fiction like that i would say that books come first and mm. there is there is obviously another argument to it which is that you approach the kind of books that you think will be the most relevant to you okay. and i think now is that's what i've been doing so it's really kind of this kind of feedback loop because mm. i right now i'm approaching more of sort of economically slanted books and they are they're giving me new angles to think about and that may approach like that may kind of determine the way i approach doing economics or approach sort of just what i choose to do with my time and it's really uh, yeah it's really a feedback loop i remember just to just to keep continuing i remember the first, um i read god of small things you know that oh. for sure because we keep talking about it I read god of small things i think 4 years or uh, i'm 19 now when i was 15 yeah 4 years back and every story that i read after that you know it has this capitalizations yeah. and it has those random personifications of yeah. very normal concepts like yeah. anger written in capital a capital a and that amazed me and mm-hmm. in in the few next few stories or even sort of essays that i wrote after that even for call even for high school then i i used that you know mm-hmm. i did yeah. those capitalizations those very dramatic pauses changing of mm-hmm. paragraphs all that structure so it, so in that sense the book definitely did come first oh yeah i i agree mm-hmm. even i did the same thing i don't think i think arundhati roy's writing influenced me so much that i think for a solid year or two i i tried to write like her and then i realized that for that's sure. just that's not possible at all um it's just it's so weird because i read so much and then i i i i keep going back to this thing like um i have to write right after i read a book like it, it's not mm-hmm. uh, i can't do without it i have to write and most of like when i'm in a slump i go back to reading because i know that it will make me want to write 
So I just enter this dilemma where I I keep feeling like I'm copying the, the writer's style mm-hmm. uh, while I'm reading their book. And I just feel so scared about that. I, I don't know what to do. Like, I know that you write too. So <laughs> do you go through that as well? I'll agree with you. I, I, I go to read mostly to write, mm-hmm. you know, because uh, e- even now when I, I, I felt like I was in this phase of sort of a poverty of ideas where I thought mm-hmm. that I had the same kind of textbook knowledge that I'd been gaining over the past few months. And yeah. definitely, I, I, in fact, just yesterday for Arithmeti, our economics journal, we have this book review part. And I wrote a, I wrote a review on um, Everybody Loves a Good Draw. Precisely for that reason, I just wanted to sort of articulate my feelings about it in some way. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think you have... Sorry, what was the question again? I zoned out. <laughs> Do you like? Do you feel like you? Oh yeah, 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 I, yeah, I, yeah. Like yeah. I don't see that as that big a problem. I used to fear that too, you know. But then I spoke to my dad a lot, and again, he's into film, so he always keeps giving film yeah. examples. And there's a lot. If you if you look at sort of some of the great writers, a lot of them, they say. I mean, their originality is kind of based on a mixture of many styles that existed before them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this one example I keep using, even though he's controversial, is Woody Allen. And you may hate his personal life, for sure. I'll agree with you there. But if you look at sort of his, um, the way he's developed in terms of his um, sort of film journey, mm-hmm. he was a crazy um, bhakt, as you would say, of <laughs> um, Ingmar Bergman's films. He's a Swedish um, director, very yeah. famous, right? Mm-hmm. And every every film in some sort had a reference to him and that's what people say like that's what people in the film prof- like pre- film industry say that he began as someone who wanted to worship um uh, worship bergman but in doing that he kind of ends up coming mm-hmm. up with his own style and that's almost like accidental mm-hmm. so yeah. every stroke of i think originality isn't really quite what we see and okay. you may think that you you are more derivative but I don't think that people quite will see it that way because just the collection of books that you have read, mm-hmm. I don't think precisely that combination of influences nobody else has. Yeah. So I think you still retain that element of originality in you. So I've kind of stopped kind of worrying too much about it. Yeah. Basically, if you mix up everything you've read, nobody will notice. Come, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's actually a really good segue into our topic, like our genre for the day, uh, which is philosophy. Mm-hmm. And, and, and the reason I say that is because uh, Nietzsche is something someone we truly yeah. love. Um, and he, he, you know, he really got into philosophy after reading uh, Immanuel Kant's work. And he used to be a huge, huge fan. I don't know if he was a fan, but he was a huge fan of Kant's work. And then once he started writing his own stuff, he heavily criticized him. And he he really went, you know, away from what Kant spoke about. So I think that's what philosophers do. They <laughs> they idealize something and then they go so far away from it just to prove a point. Um, but that's just my personal rant against philosophy. We can go into why um, philosophy is such a big deal for you, um, how you came about it. And what it means to you personally. Just talk about that. Fair enough. (laughs) I think what you said is definitely true. And I think that is sort of how philosophy has to work. You start Mm -hmm. by, you know, you have this ideal that you create in your head. And over time, of course, you're going to see that that ideal doesn't match up to your standards. So you you are almost compelled to break it down. And Mm -hmm. you see it happening throughout history. You see it with the, you know, with the Socrates play to Aristotle, the Greek tradition where one builds up over the others and almost hates the other one. Aristotle hated Plato in many, in many instances. And you see, yeah, you see that happening in Christian theology all the time Mm -hmm. over the night, like Augustine, Boethius and so on. And again, in Renaissance, Nietzsche coming back to modern sort of uh, modern philosophy. So yeah, I think you need that element of worship. I I, I love this example of Freud and um, who's the other guy? (laughs) <laughs> um dude what's the other who's the other guy dude i told you to come prepared <laughs> <laughs> oh william james yeah no no no. 
William James? No. No, no, Carl I Hume, Carl Hume. I, why did yeah. I forget that? Carl Hume, yeah. yeah. They were very good friends and Carl Hume because... Really? He, 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 I yeah, don't know that. Um, Carl Hume used to worship Freud, almost worship oh. Freud, until they had this difference in opinion about, especially the idea of the subconscious and, um, you know, Carl Hume thought that there were kind of archetypes that you come when you that you come Correct. prepared with when you're born, so to say. Hmm. So they yeah, so you always have that kind of a breakup that happens with your <laughs> ideal. Yeah. But yeah, coming back to my personal relationship, I I I started getting back to philosophy a lot. I was reading um, Amartya Sen's idea of justice mm. a while back. Mm. And it really made me kind of it, it's a good summary of why I love philosophy. There's a kind of purity to it. And it's hmm. it may be the reason why people criticize philosophy in the same way they criticize maths that great mm -hmm. looks good in theory but doesn't work in practice or you can't use right. those you know principles of philosophy to argue in real life mm -hmm. real life is more complicated but mm -hmm. i think it's always very refreshing every once in a while to go back to those first principles mm -hmm. and build and build found like build the foundation of your real life on that so i think that's the role that philosophy has played for me just Mm -hmm. helps me build this foundation of knowledge which may not be enough in tackling real world issues for sure i'm not mm -hmm. arguing that philosophy is foolproof but yeah just sort of a theoretical sort of a platonic ideal of how knowledge should be yeah i think i would go ahead and argue that i don't think philosophy needs to um, needs to work in practice i don't think it needs to work in the real world at all i think uh, i think it was a quote by Milan Kundera, I think it was uh, mm -hmm. ignorance, where he said that uh, to question one's existence and, and their purpose for existing is probably one of the most human things you will ever do. And it is inevitable. You will question why you're here. You will question what the point of it all is. And um, what philosophy does is that it just gives you a sort of, um, yeah, like you said, a foundation to build on that uh, idea and, and, and to make whatever you want of it. So for me, I think Milan Kundera was the first book, uh, was the first, he's not a philosopher, but I think his books really sort of uh, got me into that mindset of really questioning why things happen, what is the point. Um, and um, I think we have also talked about how much we love unbearable lightness of being, right? Uh, do you want to talk a little <laughs> bit about that book? I think Milan Kundera, yes, not a, okay, not officially a <laughs> philosopher, but I think you can't read. Sorry, just a second. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, not officially a philosopher, but I do think that you cannot read his novels without knowing philosophy. The, just the first paragraph of mm -hmm. the premise of unbearable lightness of being I argues about Parmenides' ideas, right? And throughout, you see rants against Nietzsche, you see rants against, again, returns back to the, um, the idea of eternal return that Parmenides eternal said. Eternal recurrence, and, yeah. Yeah, eternal recurrence, yeah. So that, yeah, I, I think uh, The Unbearable Lightness of Being for me has, it's one of the most brilliant books I've seen in the way that it mixes philosophy with literature. And yes. that's a book I keep coming back to because even the characters themselves mm -hmm. are deeply, their existence almost is on the line. You yeah. know, every character's existence is on the line and philosophy is their answer. And <laughs> yeah, it's really like, I keep thinking about say Thomas and his journey from lightness to heaviness. And yeah. you have to, I mean, these are all life journeys. It's one of those books that it takes a lifetime to figure, like really understand their importance. I think mm -hmm. Unbearable Lightness of Being is that. Then there's the Apu trilogy by uh, yeah. Sotujit Ray, the three films. These, these are the kind of things that you have to come back every, say, one or two years and see how you're faring and see Absolutely. how your journey has happened in, in tandem, so to speak, with the characters and and my, like, I keep comparing my life to Apu in that Apu yeah, trilogy, I... right? And yeah, unbearable lightness of being is definitely that. You feel moments of lightness. feel And, and really, philosophy for them is the answer, as you said. Hmm. The, the answers of which, which is more important, right? Whether yeah. we burden ourselves with responsibility, complexity of lives, you know, um, 
Thomas for a while wants to keep going into politics. He wants to really make a difference because he thinks taking up that would make him happy. And there's this wonderful scene which I think is unparalleled. Is that hmm. after everything that happens to Thomas and Teresa, right? They go back. They he's a surgeon, one of the top surgeon. He leaves that. He works as a window washer and then goes back hmm. to a village. This they build this life in village in a village in Czechoslovakia at the time and. One day he sees Karenine, the the dog, their dog. Karenine is playing with a ball, and mm. this friend of his in the village, he says, "This is happiness." Yeah, I remember. That. And that's it. That's it. The guy who's who's been part of protests, who's done, who's who's a surgeon, who's tried to write letters of dissent, mm. you know, left his country, exile, all this complexity. But the answer is so simple. Yeah. And I think yeah, that's why you need to return back. It's one of those books you need to keep returning back to. Definitely, sure. and and I love that you said that it's a, it's the perfect example of philosophy yeah. mixing with literature, and yeah. uh, because I don't think I've read I, I've read Albert Camus' books, which we'll talk about in a bit. Hmm. But um, I don't think I, I could you have that behind. I saw that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, I, I don't think I could appreciate it. From a literature point of view, I I I love what it stood for. I loved the story. I loved everything about the outsider, um, but I couldn't appreciate it or connect to it as much as I could to someone like Milan Kundera and his books. Mm-hmm. Um, and 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 I think the the most beautiful part about the unbearable lightness was that you see yourself there. You you see yourself as Thomas, as Teresa, as Sabrina. You see yourself there and you see the lives they're leading. You see how messed up that is and you see yourself. And and for, say, a 15-year-old or a 16-year-old who has no relationship with philosophy as a genre, who's never read Kant or Nietzsche or, or Seneca, who's never read any of these people, for someone like that to just read this book, it, it's such a beautiful introduction. Um, and and yeah, I don't think someone like Albert Camus can can I think fit that box. And he is again, he is a genius in himself. Um, have you read The Outsider? Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I'm gonna admit I'll... when I read it, when I read it, I read it in one go, in one setting. I couldn't like hundred pages. Yeah, I yeah, couldn't yeah, yeah. stop myself uh, because it was the story was just so so strong. Um, but I don't know. It just felt confusing. <laughs> when I'll I tell you about. this about the difference between, say, Kundera and even Nietzsche, for that matter, because mm-hmm. even Ni- Nietzsche, Camus, all all in the same category of philosophers who attempted at fiction. Mm-hmm. Because if you look at Das spoke Zarathustra, yeah, Nietzsche's book, it's fiction. I, I read yeah. that. It's it's fiction, but it's really not fiction. You know, it's, it's really it's, fiction is more of a cover, and I think that's the difference. Where you have to classify Kundera as a novelist, mm-hmm. Kamu isn't a novelist, and mm-hmm. even Nietzsche isn't a novelist. They're all philosophers who are using fiction as this kind of umbrella or this, yeah. Um, yeah, as a medium. It's it's a very shallow way of treating literature. I think <laughs> Kamu still does a better job than Zarathustra, um, because in that, it's really. I mean the entire book of Zarathustra is really just him going from one one place to another and lecturing. The lectures is like 80% <laughs> yeah, of the novel. Exactly. He goes to so, every area and he talks about how much he hates it. That's about it. That's the ho- whole book. Yeah. And he's tried to incorporate them by using those physical metaphors of a man crossing a rope, but that's not, you don't, you don't call that fiction. It's <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, he is great in its, in his own right, but I'll give you that. Um, I think the artistic merit, so to speak, mm-hmm. the creative merit is is far superior for Kundera. And I think mm-hmm. not many, many people have tried that, but it's really hard for people to kind of get those two together. And yeah. I think a good example will also be Sophie's World. Mm-hmm. Have you heard of it? Yeah. I, I think I um, have, yeah. Go ahead. Sophie's World. I would say that, I mean, it's one of those classic intro- introductions to philosophy. It's this girl who receives these uh, letters from a random person she doesn't know who the secret person every week or i think every every day or every week i don't remember and there are all these long letters describing philosophy to her as as if the way you would describe or introduce philosophy to your own daughter 
Correct. And later, it, spoiler, it turns out that that person is the father of Sophie. But okay. anyway, so yeah, in, in those things, fiction is always this kind of cover up for what you're really trying to sell, which is philosophy. Yeah. I think so I understand honestly, if you don't yeah. appreciate it. It's a little sad as well that philosophers have to, you know, continuously fight against this notion of being elitist and and, and having these really Just pretentious boring. thoughts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, boring would be uh, the best way to put it. And they have to actively fight against it. And it's it, it keeps going on. This fight keeps happening in every... Um, it keeps going on and, and they can't get away from it. So they have to use something like literature to you know, kind of dilute what they're trying to say um, and, mm-hmm. and make it more commercial, which is really sad, I feel. I don't know if that's, if that's very, uh, I don't know if there's any budding philosopher who's watching. I, mean, I feel bad for you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think, I mean, I get what you're trying to say, but I'm also kind of worried about the other, other side, that mm-hmm. just the idea of a sort of dry philosophy book, no matter mm-hmm. how, how or original it is will not attract the kind of audience that it will if it had sort of a fictional cover to it mm-hmm. and that's i think a problem that many academics face that you can be brilliant but your reach to an audience is always very little mm-hmm. i i see that happening in um, economics all the time you hear the word economics it's like ah shut up dude <laughs> like I don't want to listen to you and especially this like research paper and it's even even truer for um, people in the scientific field where it's mm-hmm. plain inaccessible for yeah. the rest yeah. of the world. So it, I, I would say that if done well, it has a great scope. I Absolutely. think that novel of ideas or philosophical novels have a great scope. Mm-hmm. But I, just like you, even I'm opposed to it because I like the purity mm-hmm. of it, as I, as I told yeah. you before, mm-hmm. the purity of philosophy. So absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 you know, going back to what you said about what we talked about, you know, how uh, Milan Kundera has this ability to make his characters human and, and to bring them back to life and make them look like you and me and, and how we have, we struggle with our daily problems and we have our stupid things and, and, and we are very, in that sense, very small uh, compared to the larger scheme of things. And I feel like someone who did that um, very well was also Marcus Aurelius uh, with mm. Meditations. And it's, I think I appreciate that book so much more than anything else is because um, he is a king. He is like an emperor. He's not exactly you and me, but it, it still hits. It, it still makes sense. Have, I mean, have you read it? Yeah, meditations. Yeah, yeah. I think I read it in twenty twenty only this year itself, uh-huh. hmm. or maybe last year. But I think it's a great Marcus Aurelius is a great kind of example to use in our discussion. The reason mm-hmm. being, he's not. Let's not look at him even as a human being. Let's look at him as an idea of what he represents. Mm-hmm. And he's one of those few people. I think Nehru would be a great example too to compare him with because mm-hmm. he's not. He is a practical man. He has to deal with practical yeah. things because king, after all. But he has this idealism in himself. He has, he believes that you have to have a philosophical grounding mm-hmm. in order to make these good decisions. And he sees, if you look at meditations, he often sees philosophy as an antidote, so to speak, to chaos. Yeah. And he looks at he looks at philosophy as something to actually use in practical life rather than kind of leave behind when you enter. These, they're not two separate compartments. And I think mm-hmm. Marcus Aurelius is something we definitely need more in our world. I think, especially with Absolutely. political leaders who, I call me an idealist if you want, but I think you need that. And you definitely need more people who are well-versed in the theory of things. I look at Kamu as what you said, the, one of those people who has made uh, philosophy seem something glorious and happy and uh-huh. because you know most people when you look at philosophers lives you see that the half of them committed suicide half mm-hmm. of them went crazy by the end some guy Nietzsche for instance and mm-hmm. Schopenhauer this terribly pessimistic kind of life <laughs> yeah and you you compare those with Camus and it's it's a very life affirming philosophy it's not mm-hmm. criticizing about life but it's yes there is no meaning to life that's a very basic thing to say, let's move on. Mm-hmm. It doesn't even take that question seriously. And and the myth of Sisyphus, um, the beginning 
word at the start of the beginning line of that is that there is only one truly serious philosophical question that needs to be considered uh -huh. and that is whether man should or not should commit suicide or not yeah. whether or not life is worth living yeah. is of true like is of the first importance something like that mm -hmm. and if all his characters in the end they see i think they find joy and they they dare to look at the meaninglessness meaninglessness of life and mm -hmm. they accept it and there is no kind of sadness to it it's he realizes he, that everything that happened in the outside he sort of almost accidentally killed yeah. those people and because yeah. he was not repentant the the sort of jury found him doubly guilty mm -hmm. so and so they sentenced him to death but saw antichrist i remember that the yeah antichrist yeah mm -hmm. the antichrist and in do it he he realizes that dude none of this makes sense like he had this period of wanting to wanting things to make sense but then he realizes that life doesn't have this super order so to speak that there is some kind of cars karmic justice that's going to happen mm -hmm. it's meaningless actually let's now that it, yeah now that's the final acceptance yeah now that i'm now that you said it now that i'm actually starting to think about the outsider and kamu's work i think i agree he was the one that um you know kind of accepted the absurdity of life and said that everything is meaningless there's no sense of anything and you should kind of just accept it and find happiness but kafka i think the sadness comes from the fact that he didn't accept it he didn't want to his characters didn't inherently want to accept that life was meaningless and uh, that 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 yeah the hopelessness comes from that i agree i think now i'm now that i go back to think um all, about all the books that i've read yeah i agree and even if you look at the myth of sisyphus the whole story is what you said about accepting meaningless sisyphus mm -hmm. the character right mm -hmm. his he has he's gotten this punishment by the by the gods for eternity all he has to do is push a boulder up a mountain every day mm -hmm. only to see it fall back mm -hmm. every night and he has to go down he has to do that again and back for eternity and that's that's kamu says that that is what kind of life is you do yeah. everything only to fall back again only to try again and the the concluding lines are nevertheless one might imagine one must imagine sisyphus happy mm -hmm. so i think yeah kamu that's why i continue to like kamu despite say his desire to mix philosophy with literature i think he's done a good job in the outsider nevertheless definitely and i think um... mortality i mean we haven't really talked about mortality that much but it plays such a huge role in the philosophers lives and when you read their work you kind of understand why they pay so much attention and there's so much emphasis on mortality that happiness comes from the fact that life ends and life is going to end um and it's inevitable and and it's it when at the outset it it feels like a very morbid thought that you would try to find happiness in the fact that everything it will end and you will some day die a pretty horrible death who knows but it it kind of really makes sense once you sit with it and you let that thought kind of simmer into your soul <laughs> um so yeah I, I, i'll be yeah. honest with you yeah. it's uh, <laughs> death is one of those things and still not i have many opinions on it and i'm not comfortable with it because absolutely it's it's hard to imagine because you're born knowing only life you mm -hmm. don't have any experience of death you don't know what it means to not be there mm -hmm. and i don't know how, I, i mean i know everything that we're doing no matter what times proceeding that way it's towards eventual death but i don't know i'm still i i really am not still comfortable with the idea of imagining my own death and what death, that would yeah. look like absolutely and i think i think one of the reasons i still read go back to philosophy or read philosophy is because of that because we are not comfortable with the idea of our own death and i don't think any of us could ever be completely comfortable with it which is why we turn to I books like these don't you think that's also a big appeal of religion absolutely and i think it's yeah. it's one of the main reasons why especially a lot of older people you see going back and and i mean i'll bring back this i um the name of bergman here mm -hmm. if you 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 search him all his films consistently are to do with the themes of mortality mm -hmm. um the seventh seal a great example is about death is about facing death and 
him one of the most influential atheists of the 20th mm-hmm. century became a devout catholic near his end he became a devout catholic before dying i think in the last 10 or so years of his life and i don't know i i, I used to be a very serious serious atheist and mm-hmm. i would argue every single time everyone brought religion it's irrational doesn't make sense but i'm starting to see the appeal of religion honestly absolutely it, it makes so much of life so much of this philosophy of life a lot more comfortable to deal with and live with yeah because think, mortality is such a natural fear to have and that's what it absolutely. tackles absolutely that exactly the the whole purpose of religion is that it answers life's most um you know like scary question which is what happens to you when you die and where do you go where does the soul go where is your um all of these experiences that you ha- that you've had where does all of it go like if i have to quote <laughs> arundhati roy our godmother uh, here um she said like where do old birds go to die go and when they die go when they die do they so, fall off do they fall <laughs> off the sky why don't they fall off? why don't the old ones fall off the sky yeah exactly exactly like what is the point to life then other than figuring out what happens to you when it ends um religion definitely answers that and i think consequently a lot of what the a lot of modern philosophy has been about is mm-hmm. if you agree as the scientific world has repeatedly said that there is no evidence to afterlife mm-hmm. if you agree that the self ends here when you die mm-hmm. only then do you even start to ask the question of what is the meaning of life because if you're a devout religious person you have no reason to even ask that question you know what the meaning to life is Mm-hmm. it's may it's doing as many good deeds as possible it's it's living up to your potential not breaking any of the laws of your religion so that you go to heaven and mm-hmm. if you're a hindu so that you're reincarnated as a sort of happier more superior being and you eventually reach nirvana so i think that is also why a big reason why nietzsche constantly said that he warned us that god is dead and we killed him right because mm-hmm. a lot of western not just literature but western philosophy was based on the central idea whether whether you look at morality uh-huh. and he, he keeps going back to kant and he criticizes kant for the same reason that how do you accept that there is there are transcendental moral laws when you mm-hmm. abandon the idea of god and religion mm-hmm. you can't square both those things either there is a transcendental life and that is the source of your morals or there isn't and if there isn't okay. what is the source of morals right so mm-hmm. nietzsche constantly said in his writing that's why i think is so influential he warned that you're going to see this collapse of philosophy in 19th and 20th century when science takes over and it says that there is no god there is no afterlife mm-hmm. and that morality is a human construct and not a kind of derivative of god's laws so i think yeah that's also one big thing that i think we definitely haven't figured out yet yeah and i think in um uh, walter i think it was walter who said this uh, if god is dead we must invent him and i think that is also something that we keep going back to is that even atheists keep going back to this that even if um there is no god and there is no you know higher power you don't go to some afterlife party when you're dead even if that doesn't exist you you still have to live the life that you're living and for it to make sense religion plays such a huge part of it even with a social function perspective like it brings people together it's a sort of community you need a community to live all of that it, it just makes sense honestly that's about it yeah you- I like that you said that about Voltaire because it's something that most and you know this the consequence of the death of god so to speak is felt mm-hmm. most in the world of justice because yeah. if you don't like if you disregard the thought that you know there is there is no god looking at each of our actions and judging them mm-hmm. then well anyone can get away with anything Absolutely. and then why should i why should i you know be and so what what really holds together justice and that that's that's kind of been a very deep interest of mine for a long time now um trying to kind of again on a on a philosophical note and on an atheistic side of it not religion how do you create a theory of justice which is mm-hmm. not based on god or any transcendental norms mm-hmm. how do you conceive of justice right and because who said that everyone deserves human rights we mm-hmm. we as we agree with that like we agree that 
we agree to that without you know questioning it but why why does everyone deserve human rights hmm there is no think, answer to that except yeah i think okay I, go on obviously some people um i don't know if this is coming from an atheistic point of view or i, I don't know where it comes from but the the idea is that people deserve human rights for their uh why quality of being inherently human like that is the answer but i don't know how that makes sense i get what you're saying but i don't know what it is rights, about being human that's the key yeah. thing right um as voltaire and mill and everyone said the government intervention part of it mm-hmm. rights as something that need to be preserved that mm-hmm. government should not take an active kind of stance towards preserving these human human rights that are supposedly kind of natural you born with them the na- the question to ask is what gave you those rights who yeah. gave you those rights why is everyone born with them there is nothing about nature that says that everyone deserves to be alive mm-hmm. evidently if you look at the animal world not everyone deserves to be alive Correct. people die and you know when a when a when a tiger kills a deer you don't talk about justice then Mm-hmm. you don't talk about the, the right to god. life but why specifically yeah. humans the big god prays on the little god that's the the whole the whole perspective about the whole point about nature is that the bigger animal prays on the little animal and that's how it keeps going on and on and on the whole cycle of life is that but that's i mean these are the so that was a question and i i think one great answer to that about how do you construct justice the theory of justice in the absence of god Mm-hmm. is someone called robert nozick he's a philosopher he's a philosopher of justice and he wrote a book called the theory of justice and he talked about this idea of um an original wheel which is mm-hmm. that you forget all of your present circumstances you forget your nationality your status male female your gender forget everything mm-hmm. and go back to an original stage before you were born okay mm-hmm. let's all go back to that stage a wheel of ignorance mm-hmm. that suppose you're standing behind this wheel and you don't know the real world and you don't know how you were going to be born whether you're going to be born as a chinese peasant or you're going to be born as an american billionaire you don't know correct in that wheel of ignorance the principles of justice that you can conceive of or that you can agree on are mm-hmm. the true principles of justice and they and those are the justice and those are the rules that are derived from pure reason so maybe mm-hmm. then you would you would agree that let's you know we agree that there's going to be a lot of inequality there let's try to create some principles around inequality to contain it we don't mm-hmm. want too much inequality we want every, we want to give people equality of opportunity and mm-hmm. you might think that well we don't want i don't just want to die one day because someone feels like they want to kill me and they're angry so let's also have the right to life mm-hmm. and you know there's a lot of and you look at earth and there's enough water for everyone so let's also have right to basic resources for mm-hmm. everyone that a state needs to assure so these are the i like he i i think that's one of the more convincing things that he said that you can create principles of justice that are absolutely that are in no way connected to mm-hmm. a god or a transcendental being there are pure reason you can derive justice from pure reason and i think a lot of modern philosophy has been kind of attempting to create a solid theory of justice even amartya sen's idea of justice is, is exactly on that topic yeah what yeah. what does a just society mean and what are the principles we can agree on hmm. so i i do think that, that there is a lot of scope for having justice or having these principles that we abide by almost as if they are given to us by god hmm. but not god but not. it's yeah. reason yeah that, that's that's so interesting to even think about and and it is something that most of us should think about and i think that's a perfect note to kind of wrap up our episode today uh because so it's 743 <laughs> for sure yeah yeah I'll let you end before, it <laughs> before we end it i just have like a couple of quick questions that i want to ask you and and mm-hmm. you need to answer them like really quickly okay that's kind of like a uh shelf life rapid fire thingy rapid fire okay <laughs> scary go okay. on it's not a lot just it's just a few questions okay so mm-hmm. the first one is um given everything that we've talked about today considering just hypothetically that there is a heaven 
okay, that there is an after party. And all of these philosophers that we just spoke about, say Nietzsche, Kafka, Kant, um, everyone, everyone that we spoke about, they all find a way to get to the after party. <laughs> what do you think they will do? Uh, what is the first thing that they will see? that they will they will do i'm so sure these people will go into crazy argument like there's going to be a lot of throwing wine bottles around <laughs> you know yeah. throwing pies around at each other because these are people who have shaped the course of history but they've also intensely disagreed with each other so if there mm -hmm. is a heaven they're definitely shouting okay second question for you um say god meets you tomorrow morning what are you going to say oh, to him Wow, didn't know you were there. <laughs> I don't know. Good to see you. Really? <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know. Like, I'll, I'll just say that. Okay, let's, okay, let's, so let's, make it a little, yeah. let's make it a little bit easier for you. What do you think he'll say to you? He, she, they, what do you think they'll say to you? What would go? I mean, that's a question for God, not for me. How do I <laughs> answer that? Um, I think he'll be definitely pissed at me. I don't know, not pissed at me, or it's either it's either that he'll praise me to an extent if he is a real god for not accepting things without evidence. I think mm. a real god would want that, not blind faith, but kind of scrutiny. I agree, definitely. So I hope that's what God says, and He's not <laughs> angry at me for not believing in Him. And all the other uh, bunch of illegal and all the absurd things that you've done in your life, I think he will have a problem with that. <laughs> I mean, he probably has, if he is a real God, he has more important things to do than see what I do. Yeah, I don't think a lot of the, yeah, the legalities that exist in this world, I don't think they're completely, uh, you know, they're accepted or not accepted by God. I think he has a different moral code. But that's for another episode. That's just... <laughs> too big for, yeah, yeah, he's too big for to see what you do or whether you're underage yeah. drinking or not. <laughs> Come on. True, true. Bigger problems. So uh, that that's it for this episode. I'm, I'm so happy you were here, Shagnik. Uh, you really lit up the room. <laughs> Um, Thank you so much for having me. I was looking forward. I was almost offended you didn't invite me. So I know. <laughs> you've had about twenty. <laughs> you've had about twenty-three episodes, I think, so far, if not more. And I got and glad to be you. here. <laughs> exactly. I was almost offended by it, dude. Like, is she a more literature person than I am? Oh but, lord. No. Like, jokes aside. <laughs> no jokes aside. I'm really glad you invited me. It was, it was I'm, I'm, I've yeah, seen I'm a lot really of your glad. Previous <laughs> podcasts and, and they've been a yeah. delight i'm really Thank glad you. we were Thanks here and 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 you we have discussions like this all the time which is what i love and and now we have it on youtube so that's uh, even more amazing um and yeah I, I i hope to talk to you again very soon about something like this lovely and... anytime you're running short of guests just call <laughs> me i'll be there <laughs> that's that's wonderful so yeah thank you so much and uh, all right see you 